All right, welcome. Um, last December, I read uh, a very exciting post by Adrian uh, that, <laughs> that uh, he had managed to actually uh, boot FreeBSD on a couple of Atheros based pieces of hardware, and uh, one of which uh, I actually owned. And I thought, well, that's great. Finally, I can replace my OpenWRT uh, software build with uh, the operating system I actually enjoy using, which is FreeBSD. So I immediately started looking at that and noticed that uh, this particular piece of hardware um, has a switch chip which is not properly initialized by the bootloader. So in order to really use it as a wireless router, uh, you need to somehow initialize the switch. So I figured, well, I'm somewhat familiar with the OpenWRT code, so why don't I give it a shot and see if I can come up with some kind of driver that does the initialization and maybe some VLAN type of configuration. Uh, that's what led to this talk. So why do I want to do this? Because there's a lot of uh, little devices out there that are really cheap from about $30 uh, that are somewhat powerful um, and being able to run FreeBSD on them enables a couple of things that you wouldn't necessarily get. Because they have Ethernet and Wi-Fi, you can use them as routers. And uh, as I'm going to talk about, uh, there's a couple of things that you can do uh, with the hardware that the stock firmware usually doesn't support. Um, many of these devices also have a USB port, which means that the limitations of the hardware in terms of storage, for example, can be overcome by plugging in a USB uh, stick or by plugging in a hard drive or attaching all kinds of interesting hardware to that USB port. So, as I said, the firmware these devices usually come with is limited. Um, it's made as a consumer device. It's usually set up in a way that kind of does the usual stuff you would expect from such a device, but there's very much limited use for interesting stuff like actual configuration management that goes beyond what you can set up over the web interface uh, you usually cannot log in via SSH. And of course, if you have a cool idea to do something interesting with some kind of I.O. device, USB device like a camera or an X10 interface, or I have no idea, you can't do that because you cannot actually load your own software on that. So there is a number of Linux-based distributions, specialized distributions that already support all these additional applications, but simply they're not FreeBSD. So I, I want BSD on these boxes. So I'll point out Adrian. He has all kinds of hardware there. Um, that's the stuff we're talking about. What Adrian has is uh, some reference designs. So the usual consumer hardware you buy in a store looks slightly different but uh, the internals are almost identical because almost all of the manufacturers simply take the reference design and produce their own PCB and that's about it. So as I said, Adrian did most of this work already and so we're, we're just talking about adding the little, last little bits of pieces uh, to actually make this into something that works out of the box. Um, I'm going to talk about the Ethernet switch that these devices usually have. Um, Adrian is working on supporting all the different variations of uh, wireless controllers. Um, I think he has most of the work done, but there might be one or two pieces missing. Um, one big challenge is that most of these devices only have eight megs of flash or even four megs of flash. And I don't know whether you have run FreeBSD on a system that has that little storage. Last time I tried that, that was a different century. So of course, you can pare it down, but 
nobody has really looked into trimming FreeBSD, the kernel, and the user land into such a small size in a long time. So that's something uh, that needs to be addressed in one way or another. <laughs> well, is that still FreeBSD? <laughs> so, um, well, I mean, there, there is ways. It's not impossible. It's just work needs to be done. If you run a make world, it's nowhere near 8 megs. So, of course, uh, with the flash-based storage, um, you probably want to have slightly different configuration mechanisms. Um, you, you want to run with a read-only file system mostly. Uh, you want a way to write back configuration information in a sensible way. That doesn't really work necessarily with the standard RC system. So that's something we probably want to address in one way or another as well. And of course, uh, one thing that we are apparently going to get pretty soon is an actual flash file system. Right now, we run with uh, just a UFS image uh, that is mounted read-only, and we just rewrite that entire partition whenever we want to change some configuration data. With the proper flash file system, then we can just run basically normal user land with read-write access to that file system. Hmm? There we go. So I'm going to talk about four main topics. First of all, what kind of hardware is this actually? What does it consist of? What can you expect it, what properties can you expect it to have? I'm going to talk about some aspects of this Ethernet switch framework architecture, which is a pretty big word for it. actually what is supposed to be a very small driver. But we ran, ran into a couple of issues which I find quite interesting and I certainly didn't expect to run into. Um, I'm going to talk about the configuration interface, uh, mostly in terms of like what, what API can you use to uh, actually control the switch and what kind of model is behind that. And then, of course, I'm going to have a quick outlook of what we want to do in the next couple of months. So what's in the box? Uh, Adrian can maybe pass around one of these things if people want to look at it. Um, this is what a TP-Link, um, what a TP-Link uh, uh, 3420 looks like uh, that's based on a single chip design um, that's actually hidden under the heatsink uh, system on a chip with CPU and I.O. and uh, all the basic stuff. We have a ROM, a flash ROM, um, that's connected to the CPU via SPI. Uh, we have one RAM chip, two megs of RAM, um, and we got the wireless radio chip, which is connected in this case via PCIe, a single lane PCIe interface. Um, most of what you actually see on the board is more or less passive stuff and uh, like a DC-DC converter, and that's pretty much it. So all the interesting bits are in very small chips. So conceptually, uh, this looks like this. We have the CPU in the center. We have RAM and uh, some flash uh, for storage. It's uh, one or two USB ports. We have some GPIO pins, uh, which are usually just used for uh, some LEDs to indicate some state of the device. And usually two buttons, one uh, to reset the thing to factory uh, default configuration, and a second one to start WPS. Um, we have one or two Ethernet interfaces, depending on the system on the chip that's in use. Um, to that, usually we have connected a switch chip um, and, of course, a wireless interface. So in case of this uh, router, the picture that I just showed, um, that is quite highly integrated. Uh, the white box shows what's in the system on the chip. Um, so the Ethernet chip is actually part of the system on a chip. Um, external are only the RAM, the ROM, and uh, the uh, wireless radio chip. So that's the feature set, pretty common. Um, in this case, we have uh, two Ethernet ports. One is actually directly connected to a plug on the device. The second Ethernet is connected to the built-in switch controller. And uh, the switch controller can, number of, can do a number of interesting things, which, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, 
There's another device, just to give you some idea of how it could look like as well. There's a different system on a chip uh, that has different functions integrated. Um, and uh, here we have an external uh, switch chip. Um, and there's actually quite a multitude of these kinds of configurations. There's a lot of different switch chips out there. And the frustrating part is that the switch chips are uh, based on kind of the same IP blocks, but of course they differ in little details. And usually it's annoying little details that they differ in. So trying to build a driver that supports an entire class uh, of switch chip might not be that easy. Again, some uh, basic uh, features of this device. Um, interesting about this one uh, is that it only has a single Ethernet interface and all the five ports uh, on the back of it are actually connected to the switch. And this is the one that got me started because uh, the, the, the port that you plug your cable modem or your DSL modem into um, is on the switch. And if the switch is not initialized properly, um, that port is connected to the four other LAN ports. So if you switch the thing just on and it doesn't get initialized by the OS, um, computers, your local computers, are just connected to the cable modem, which usually leads to things that you don't want to happen. Okay, so some architecture. Um, we have hardware specific drivers for each switch chip and uh, we're currently hashing out how much commonality there is between the individual ones and whether we have a class driver that can handle like an entire family or whether we actually have to have different drivers and Adrian over the past couple of hours basically has uh, done some work on that um, and is probably doing that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we want to have a generic uh, in-kernel API uh, to do switch configuration and uh, get some information from the switch into the kernel, into other subsystems. And of course, we want to expose an I.O. control interface to your land so you can run a command line utility to do whatever you need to do to the switch. Um, one major thing that uh, we want, um, all these switches have a standard FIs. And we want to reuse the existing FI code and the MII bus code for the FIs as much as possible uh, in order to take advantage of all the drivers that are already there. For most of the integrated switches, it wouldn't absolutely be necessary to do that because they just work fine with the standard UK FI code. Um, but Adrian has, uh, or Adrian's employer has a couple of uh, more interesting files that might turn up in these kinds of products. So it's actually going to be beneficial to be able to use all the FI drivers that are in the system. Um, here's one switch chip, um, and that is pretty standard layout. Um, in the center, you have uh, the switch controller with a couple of Macs. Uh, the switch controller uh, takes care of forwarding stuff in the ports. Um, you have five physical ports uh, which phi, with, with a phi each. Um, and you have one CPU port where you have a back-to-back -back Mac connection. Um, the switch controller uh, is hooked up to the CPU via, via some I2C interface. Almost I2C, but not quite. Um, and on the CPU side, that's actually on just two GPIO pins because the CPU doesn't have an I2C interface. Well, sorry, correct you, it does. The CPU link comes to the wrong GPIO pins. Well, well, okay, okay. So the, the, the system on a chip could do it in hardware, but uh, TP link, for whatever reason, decided not to do it that way. So. Um, so when I started out in December, I thought, okay, how can I do this? And so I started reading code. And I was quite uh, amazed that almost all the bits are there. Um, the only thing that I really needed to even touch is the actual switch driver. So the entire attachment, the entire hardware is already in the tree. Um, there were just a couple of places that needed slight adjustment. 
the major thing was in IRC bus um, because the switch chip doesn't implement proper I square C, but some bastardized form of it, uh, I needed to relax the enforcements that are in the bus code uh, to make sure that the transaction actually works. So that was uh, actually quite nice because doing all this bit banging by hand and doing all the logic behind it and just writing that code is highly annoying and error prone. So being able to just plug this together via hints is really cool. Um, leading up to another switch chip, um, I want to quickly explain how FIs normally work because we're going to get into a situation or into a discussion where we found that our model in the tree does not work. We, we, we want it for, for the switch chip. So um, the idea is that the Ethernet card um, has the transmit logic, transmit and receive logic in, in a media independent interface form. So you actually don't have to deal with the specifics of how the bits are actually encoded on the actual transmission medium. Um, and they thought, well, we come up with a system where you can actually have multiple ones, single interface, because you might want to be able to switch between them, or it's cheaper to manufacture a single card than can hook up to multiple things. So have the actual data, data transfer lines, uh, those are here in the back, um, and that form one bus that goes to all the FIs. Um, and you have a second mini bus of two lines, MDIO and MDIC, which is IO and clock. Um, and those go to the FIs as well. And uh, that is the way uh, the CPU through the Ethernet controller can tell the FIs what to do. Um, what's important to remember is that only one of the FIs can actually be actively involved in any data transmission. So only one of the three can be active at any time. And that is reflected in our driver model. Um, there's a couple of switches that use, oh, yeah, our driver model, if you have two Ethernet interfaces, uh, each Ethernet interface gets its MII bus instance, and attached to that is some PHY or even multiple PHYs, depending on the actual Ethernet uh, controller and what PHYs are connected to it. And uh, that even auto probes, uh, there's up to uh, 32 possible PHYs that can be hooked up to the system or to each interface. Um, so the MII bus interface uh, is, well, first I should say, MII bus actually is not free BSD specific. It's shared by all BSDs, um, which immediately leads to a somewhat challenge to actually integrate that into new bus. And um, that means that um, the normal configuration mechanisms that other BSDs have or don't have um, are kind of in conflict with new bus because we're trying to stick it into new bus in ways that are compatible with new bus, but not necessarily so. Um, one way in which you can actually see that is that um, we have the new bus attachment. Those are oops. Uh, MII bus uh, interface methods uh, for accessing the M MDIO control registers, sending and writing, uh, reading and writing registers off the FIs, um, and at the same time, some messages by which MII bus, uh, when it detects some FI change, informs the Ethernet driver that it needs to adjust uh, its own MAC uh, to example, for example, to adjust uh, to a different link speed. At the same time, um, the if media uh, infrastructure has a number of callbacks that do similar things. And uh, so the MII bus not only uses some new bus methods to communicate with the interface, it also directly calls into if media and gets called by if media directly uh, without the interface actually taking part in that. Um, so,
So in order to be able to use the uh, existing PHY code uh, for our switch chips, um, we needed some way, or I needed at that point, some way uh, to uh, fake up an interface. Um, because MII bus expects to be talking to a standard if net, and it ex expect, expects it to be there. Um, so I figured I'd just try, and surprisingly that actually works. So you it can initialize an if net, and you just don't hook it into the rest of the system. It sits there. Um, nobody knows about it except our own private code. And MII bus is fine with that. So uh, we can actually use the file driver, have callbacks into the switch code, and uh, do all the things that you expect to do with the Phi, like change the speed and duplex settings and uh, shut down the port or stuff like that. So uh, that was quite nice. Um, one question for you guys uh, might be, is that actually OK? Can, can I initialize an ifnet um, and expect it to work? Um, or is there somewhere where that might be kept track of and which might get into the way of things because we suddenly have an ifnet that's not linked anywhere? OK. Switch controllers uh, that are connected to MDIO. Um, earlier switch chips presented itself like they would be FIs. You have a question or? Oh, okay, so you, you were raising your finger. <laughs> um, so they, 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 from, from a software perspective, they looked like a standard phi, and we actually have a driver for that for some real tech chip uh, in there. Uh, I don't remember quite what the model number, but basically there's, there's some stubs to actually do some initialization to the switch um, and, and have it work as a phi. Um, that's fine, um, but we cannot actually, uh, we, we don't have the interest, infrastructure to really talk to the switch part and configure it. It's somehow hard-coded in, in that driver. Um, there's other models um, of switches, uh, some of them uh, in the Atheros line, uh, that are using the MDIO bus but don't look like FIs at all. They just reuse this uh, register access space um, and they also do not present as a single file. They use the entire address space uh, of the 10 bits of address uh, that are there. Um, and of course, uh, that uh, plays havoc with MII bus uh, detection because there's worst case scenarios. It, it detects that there should be a file, but in fact, it isn't one, and it's not working like one at all. Um, so that's one problem. So how does that actually look? Um, that's uh, a model of the switch that is in uh, one of the embedded chips. Um, and we have on the right-hand side our FIs um, that are connected to the physical ports. Um, and we have built into uh, the system on a chip gigantic, uh, Ethernet ports. Um, and one thing that is interesting and uh, is, gave us a great uh, reason for a debate um, is this little thing here. So it has some control registers for an MDIO interface, but they're actually not hooked up to anything. So no problem. Well, you just use that from G1, right? But this one here is not talking to the FIs. It's talking to the switch controller. So G0 is directly connected to a single phi. So that's uh, the, the WAN port on, on, uh, on that router. So like data flows directly between the phi and the gigabit controller. But if this phi uh, sends a link uh, event, um, that interface needs to know about that. So it, it, can, it can adjust its settings. Um, how can those two actually communicate? Well, the only way they can do that is through the switch controller onto a second MDIO controller that is implemented in the switch, in the switch register space, and then get onto this MDIO bus to talk to this file. That doesn't really work well with our existing code. So um, the device attachment 
tree um, is something like this, where um, uh, the, the ARG0 um, somehow needs access to an MII bus that is actually attached to the switch because it hangs off the MDIO control registers that are in the switch. So we need something in here, oops, we need something in here that somehow enables this kind of communication. And to my great surprise, um, this has never come up before. This apparently was the first time that there's any piece of hardware that cannot be modeled by a tree. Like there's actually need for having some additional communication between uh, nodes in the device tree. It's, it's been known for a long time. Okay, I, I asked on ARC and nobody could tell me of an example where that problem came up and how it was solved then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure, of course. So we tried a couple, or I tried a couple of things. I, I wrote like five different prototype implementations of how to deal with this. And we eventually ended up with two possible ways of uh, doing this. So um, uh, Alexander uh, decided uh, he's going to write a special Phi driver that takes care of this. So this Phi driver uh, has some internal knowledge of what switch it actually wants to talk to to issue register reads on uh, the real Phi, but it's going to present itself as just a standard Phi um, on an MII bus, and that MII bus is just normally attached uh, to G0. Um, so in terms of the tree, you can see that's very nice and very clean. Uh, it has a couple of drawbacks. Uh, first, it needs to have access to that other node. It needs to find that. That needs to be solved. So there's different ways on how to do this. Um, <coughs> he found a very simple way that worked in his case. So um, one problem with this is that it replaces the existing Phi drivers because to MII bus it's just a Phi driver. So whatever features the actual <coughs> Phi requires need to be re-implemented in this driver. Um, plus I'm not entirely certain that all the features that a Phi driver uh, can present are actually going to work in this way because the MII bus generic code also acts, accesses uh, the MDIO registers directly uh, bypassing the Phi. So I'm not sure how to deal with that. Um, but he, he did get it to the point where he can actually get link status uh, of the parts. And that in itself is, is very useful to have. Um, the second option that I decided to implement is a bit more complicated, so I split this up a bit. Um, so we have an attachment um, to um, GE0. It has an MIA proxy connected to it, which is the new piece. and to the uh, proxy is uh, connected is uh, the MII bus and some uh, Phi driver according to the normal uh, mechanism uh, that MII bus uses. So all the interesting bits happen here. So how does that get to actually talk to the right MDIO lines? Well, we have a new driver um, that only implements the MDIO register access. It's the exact same interface as uh, MII bus, reg read, reg write, uh, but it splits that out from MDIO, um, sorry, from MII bus. So it exports a generic MDIO bus, and connected to that is the actual switch driver. Um, I added that in here because that is the address of the MDIO controller on G1, not G0. Okay, um, so, and because that is kind of generic, uh, the driver does the very same thing. It has its own MDIO access uh, to the switch hardware that uh, controls the MDIO, M MDIO bus in the switch and then exports another MDIO bus to any consumer that might be interested in that. And we have a second piece, which is an MDIO proxy. Of course, 
these two are connected. That's the whole trick. Um, so the G0 interface gets a hint, has additional code. If that hint is present, it instantiates uh, the MII proxy and tells it to which MDIO proxy it wants to connect. Um, that turned out to be actually a lot more complicated than I first thought, uh, basically for two reasons. Um, Newbus um, has an API that uh, guarantees that you cannot obtain device references outside of uh, the contexts in which it can guarantee that they won't go away. So you cannot simply ask Newbus, oh, give me the pointer to the device uh, with, uh, I, I don't know, ARG1. That call doesn't exist. It, ex it exists internally, but not externally. And at first I thought, oh, that's annoying. I'll just add that. And then I thought about it and realized, no, no, that's probably on purpose. Because once I have that pointer in hand, I will never get notified when that device goes away. So I would have a dangling pointer if that device ever gets unloaded. So I need something uh, that actually uh, takes care of dynamic loading and unloading and attaching and detaching of drivers. So that's why there are these two halves that have an internal connection. And what the hint does uh, is actually tell this device, look out and see when that attaches, create that connection. And when one of them detaches, that connection is broken. Um, and then uh, calls to this proxy simply uh, return an error because the connection has been broken. So there will be no dangling pointers. Of course, in the embedded world, those drivers will never be unloaded, or I can't, cannot really foresee that happening, but why not do it right if you can? Um, okay, great. Okay. Okay. So, um, The main feature of this is it splits up the MDIO access, register access to the FIs from the notification, from the communication between the FIs and uh, the Mac of the Ethernet interface. Um, it does that by having two attachment points, uh, one for the interface, one for the MDIO uh, register driver, and uh, it has one main feature. It's completely transparent to MDIO bus. So MDIO uh, doesn't, uh, sorry, MII bus. MII does actually not see that there's anything different. Okay. Um, what was I going to say with this? <laughs> um, so at that point, uh -huh. you can yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one point I forgot actually uh, to mention, and that is uh, probe order. Um, so Nubus uh, actually has an order parameter in its API, but nobody uses it. And uh, one we ran into uh, is that uh, we actually need to make sure that this probes first. Because once ARG0 uh, gets into its attached routine, it just expects to be able to fully initialize. And I tried playing the actual attachment of the interface, but that didn't really work. So um, one hack is actually to add a parameter to uh, the MIPS nexus. Uh, have an additional hint that uh, makes sure that this gets probed first and attached first because of that. So, any better suggestions? I'm very happy to hear them. But somebody like told me, oh, that's a crude hack, you cannot do that. My justification is it's already in the API, it's just not exposed in any way. So, it's, and it's a one line change or two line change uh, to the Nexus attach that attaches children. Okay. Well, it's in the training now, I'm using it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs
Mm -hmm. Okay, now I remember. Okay, there's another um, point of contention between, a, uh, b b between um, Alexander and I. Um, basically, uh, how should uh, the, the hardware-specific switch driver talk to uh, the hardware, and uh, how should uh, various features be exposed in terms of the API? So, um, Alexander's idea was, oh, I'm going to write a special generic switch driver that presents a generic register interface for any and all switch chips out there. Because he has some hardware uh, that can actually attach through different buses. Um, I don't remember, it's, I think it's a Broadcom device. Um, yeah, that, that can either have memory mapped I.O. register access or have some I square C or MDIO register access. Um, so he wanted to make sure that um, there's actually a way uh, to have a single switch driver that uh, is abstract, abstracted from uh, how that register access, access actually happens. Um, so he decided he has, he, he will have this, this generic uh, interface uh, that presents this generic uh, register access, a couple of shim devices uh, or yeah, driver shims that, that attach to the actual bus device um, that then translate the generic API into the specific uh, bus uh, calls. Um, the switch driver then attaches to this uh, particular, uh, to, to this generic driver. Um, when, he, when I finally understood what he was trying to do, I figured, um, well, I thought I had read something about bus space. Isn't that exactly what he's trying to do? And um, so one thing that, that uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. Um, so that's how that attachment would look like. And uh, the interesting bit basically is here, uh, the IO control uh, CDEV that exports uh, the genetic functions. And as you can see, Basically, you can only attach one hardware-specific driver at this point. Uh, you would need multiple switch drivers to have multiple drivers attached here. And also, it's a bit, it's not obvious to me how you would actually connect up in kernel uh, driver that wants to talk to the switch. Because this interface basically is for the hardware-specific driver so oh, do you attach that here as well? And what kind of interface would it use? Would it be the new bus methods for the switch driver or some other set of drivers? And uh, I haven't heard an answer to that question yet. Like he, he I don't know, <coughs> he needs to tell that himself. Um, the model that, that I came up with, I think, is straightforward how the APIs are supposed to be used. So we have uh, a hardware-specific driver that attaches to whatever uh, bus the hardware is actually attached to, like I square C or uh, MDIO or memory mapped IO or whatever. Um, each of the switch drivers exports a generic API that uh, translate from a generic control model into the hardware-specific settings. Um, and the way it does that, uh, it exposes um, a set of Nubus methods to do the actual configuration. And then we have a generic driver that basically just translates IO controls into these Nubus methods. Um, and of course, this interface is available to other drivers as well. So one thing that could be implemented in the future might be uh, some spanning tree implementation for one of these switches and that could be attached at this point and could use the very same configuration interface to configure the switch in the appropriate way. Okay. Um, configuration interface. Um, these switches are all over the place. Like some are very simple, can do very few things. Others have very advanced features. So it is unclear how we can actually put that into a single model that can be 
presented uh, as a single utility to do configuration on because even the way uh, VLANs are configured can vary widely bet between these things. And like, can you mix port-based and uh, tagged VLANs on the same device? And if you can mix them, how does that actually work? Like, what is the precedence on the single port, or what gets discarded, what gets added uh, automatically, or, or detagged? So um, there's a couple of things that that almost all of them can uh, do that we looked at, and uh, that is. Basically, all of them have some form of phi or another. So we can do link management, um, including shutting down ports. Um, we, uh, there's support or uh, tag VLANs, um, usually 16 entries. Um, some have limitations on uh, the range of VLAN IDs that can actually be used, um, but many uh, can be freely configured from uh, over the full 12-bit range. And uh, there is more or less some uh, way to manage the MAC table, so there could be a way to disable learning and hard code uh, which uh, uh, ports forward for which MACs. So we really want to have, and we're very close to actually having that in the tree, at least for the first two parts, um, is initialization. We want to bring up the switch in a sensible default configuration depending on the device. Um, want to export register access to any client uh, so that uh, we can do things in user land until we have fleshed out the actual API that we want. Uh, we will probably need some capability API so uh, a utility in user land can figure out what kind of switch it is it's trying to talk to and what it can or cannot do. Um, so, as an administrator, you can actually figure out whether something is supposed to work or not. Um, and I think the next step in terms of actual uh, configuration of this would be port-based and uh, tagged VLAN configuration. Um, we've decided that we will switch modes. It's either going to be port-based VLANs or tagged VLANs because in a sense, tag VLANs are a superset of port-based VLANs, um, at least for most configurations. Um, as I said, these switch devices can mix the two modes together, but neither Alexander nor I really understand how that works. It's, it's very confusing in the data sheets, if it's described at all. Um, there's differences in how these switch chips uh, decide what to tag and untag on which ports, like on egress and uh, ingress. So we, we decided we just have a single switch port. It's either going to be all tagged or none of it is going to be tagged. That's a certain limitation, but I think for the kind of switches we're talking about with only four ports, that's, that, that is a semi-sensible uh, restriction. Um, there's a default VLAN ID, which for the untagged ports decides uh, what VLAN ID to uh, assign uh, frames uh, on ingress. And um, of course, each of the VLAN configuration entries has a VLAN ID and a list of the member ports. Okay. So um, what's still to be done? Um, <coughs> Basically, Adrian has made the call and has decided this is what's going into the tree, and he's committed the last bits yesterday. There's lots of code, uh, especially that Alexander has, that uh, we want to bring into what we have now decided is going to be the base version. Um, so that's going uh, to require a lot of work. I think he has around, I don't know, 15 or 20 different switches, something in that range. Yeah, so it's, but it, it, it's a lot. It's a lot across different vendors. Um, so we'll see uh, how, how that goes. And uh, then pick up whatever is left uh, in common hardware. Um, like to give you an idea of the space we are talking about, like the uh, Atheros uh, base designs alone 
uh, there's like, I don't know, 80 or 100 different models of routers by like 20 vendors. So dealing with all that is hard enough, but then there's of course Broadcom-based designs and Realtek and I don't know what. So it's, it's, it's hundreds, hundreds of different models. Sorry, what? It, 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 more than I can remember. So um, we'll look into like good things to support. Like, of course, uh, they should be not too expensive. They should be powerful enough. And we should get so, working code. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, um, what can be done in the future with this? <coughs> so, of course, uh, all these switches, since they do uh, support tagging, almost all of them support some form of priority queues. Um, all of them support more or less uh, deciding what gets forwarded where. Uh, some of them actually have quite advanced uh, things in there. Um, up to actual packet filtering. Um, and I think the newest Atheros uh, switch chip actually does IPv6. I was really surprised. So um, the newest one also can do some form of NAT for IPv4. <laughs> Um, so it might be interesting to see how to integrate that and, and what to do with that because, of course, the CPU in these things is somewhat limited. So, so you can maybe do 100 megabit wire speed, but above that it, it gets hairy. And you might want to use the CPU for interesting bits like actually talking to the wireless chip and shuffling data back and forth between that and the Ethernet interface. Uh, so if the hardware can actually do the NAT for you, that's one less thing you need to deal with in software. Um, one thing that I think might make a really great uh, Google Sum of Code project is trying to figure out if the existing spanning tree implementation that we have in the tree can be hooked up to one of the switch controllers because almost all of them support punting uh, the management frames to the CPU port. So they don't implement spanning tree themselves, but you could implement it on the CPU and pull the switch to enable forwarding on the ports or disable it. And uh, of course, you can also do things like port security or stuff like that if you're interested. And I'm sure there's plenty more things that can be done in terms of interesting networking stuff. Um, but that's going to be available then. Um, one thing that, um, I'll leave that off, that's fine. Okay, so here's the people involved and a couple of links. Uh, the wiki page I have set up uh, currently is more of a brain dump than a tutorial, so I need to work on that and bring it in line with what we now have in the tree. Um, Z-Router is Alexander's project, which is FreeBSD based, but it's his attempt together with a number of other people to um, build uh, like ready to use firmware images for many of these devices, including their own uh, web-based configuration in standard ways. So basically, it's to replicate a standard firmware for standard use cases like OpenWRT or DDWRT or something like that. Um, so that might be very interesting as well to look at. All right, questions? Uh, I haven't done IPsec. I'm, I'm more, uh, I'm using um, OpenVPN. And uh, current hardware, like the, the 400 uh, megahertz MIP, uh, C CPUs that are typically in there, uh, can, can do around, I don't know, five, six megabits second encryption with, uh, um, in, in software, yeah, with the right uh, encryption algorithm. But so that's co completely CPU bound. But it's a very interesting question, Adrian. Are, are there any CPUs that have hardware acceleration? The 
enable SOC to, to save the future app. That would be outside of Nubus then.
Adrian, ask him to, to s just swap boards so you can get one of theirs. No, I live in the US. I have to come to the VA and I have to fill out some other paperwork. You know, no, just in the next He doesn't need an export. Right. Yeah. right. So as long as we do it in the US. So I don't, yeah, he's going to show it to me easier than paperwork. He's giving me a board now. It's kind of intuitive, but I trust him. But if I'm going to know that it's just going to be for PayPal, he's going to be. Um, so, so I tried deferring, uh, completing the Ethernet driver attach until such time as I have the M MDIO register access to the right MDIO bus um, and I ran into lots of problems and that's probably because I just don't understand the code well enough but all the Ethernet drivers expect to complete their attach routine and have the IFNet completely initialized and hooked into everything, including uh, the if media structures. So at the attach point, you have to decide, is this going to be an Ethernet interface with if media or not? And so you have to defer attaching the Ethernet interface until some later time, and I couldn't get that to work with, with the R uh, RGE. Really? Uh, 
but that works. I, I work. I work. I work like that. Yes. So, sorry, the data sheets for the hardware? Yeah. Yeah, um, there's, there's two sources of information. I actually started out by uh, reverse engineering the Linux code. And then Adrian said, why don't you look at the data sheet after you've signed this NDA? Yeah. <laughs> um, and interestingly enough, um, I hope I am not violating my NDA by saying sometimes it's actually to, better to look at the Linux code because you know it's working to some degree. And the data sheet can be very confusing at times. don't have one right now. So I, I looked at the uh, Linux API, and uh, there's a couple. You could do it like that. But then again, Linux doesn't, or OpenWRT doesn't really support anything but VLAN configuration. And there's a couple things that we're interested in that go beyond that. So I think we actually might 
come up with our own API there. I explicitly committed no API for free. Mm -hmm. right? There's a VLAN group API that's not used for one of the switches. Ray has a spreadsheet capability API. He only committed the bare minimum to get the MDI robust and the MII code. The API discussion is later. Green. I want it green. I want it, I want it green. Um, yes and no. Um, so I, I wrote a command line utility that uses the same keywords to do the individual port configuration. Um, so I think that's a natural way of expressing that on the command line. Um, but as Adrian said, we haven't really committed anything to the tree yet, so we'll see how that works out. But like one specific goal is we are we are using the existing infrastructure for if media. So I expect the configuration to be similar to what what if config does. Yeah. The only comment I would that is it may be useful to give the remote what you're doing switch port No, if, if media actually uh, is very expressive, it, it tells you exactly uh, what kind of standard uh, you want to apply to that part. So. Just a quick question on in terms of development tools that you use. Do you have any tips? I'm actually just using a serial console, and that's it. So um, if you buy something off the shelf, you need to open up the case and solder in. Uh, a cable, like a cable, but that's about it. So I'm just doing this with DDB and lots of printfs. Some of the some of the vendor hardware will keep the serial port has and JTAG has on board. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Hey, most of them, Mo most of them have it on there. Okay. I haven't actually done it because I've been too lazy. But um, like I said, if you jump on the channel, I'm using this. I'm using that, and you'll have four platforms. So, Adrian, you're using something commercial, or? Yeah, we've got we've got the big block uh, wax yeah. commercial JTAG. And okay, okay. So it's an interesting question. So uh, in, in, in the, like the, the, the standard setup of these switches is that it's actually a switch, like as if you had plugged in through cable a standard desktop switch into the one port on the router. Um, almost all of these switch chips port a configuration in which they prepend uh, received frames with the port number it was received on and forward that to the CPU port. So you could write up a completely separate driver model where every single port on uh, the device is represented as a standard interface. Um, that's something we have talked about. 
Um, but I don't think anybody has any idea how to actually do that properly. Yeah, there's, there's, you can do lots and lots of things. Um, yeah, yeah, just write the driver. And like as of now, as of last night, you, you can actually start doing that if you know the switch chip and you can just peek and poke at the registers of the switch and put it into whatever configuration you like. Yes? All right, thank you very much.